Today on Green Reladon, we're going to have a little bit of fun, and I'm going to pull a possessed soldering iron prank on my friend. So here's how this is going to work. I've made this uh, small Slayer Exciter based Tesla coil from an old syringe, and it uses the 2N2222 transistor. Uh, and uh, that looks pretty nice. Though the interesting thing about this particular Tesla coil is it creates a frequency of which jams the feedback of the soldering iron that I use. Now, this is a uh, pace heat wise 100, and here's what happens when the Tesla coil is turned on. It goes red and stops producing heat. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tuck the Tesla coil inside of the desk. And I have this little switch that I'm going to glue on the edge. And uh, whenever he wants to use the soldering iron, I'm going to turn the Tesla coil on. And whenever I want to use it, I'm going to turn it off. So the soldering iron is going to work fine for me. It's not going to work for him at all. Let's see how this goes. The stage has been set. Let's see how well everything works. Soldering iron on. That's the coil on, soldering iron on, that's the coil on. Oh, that works perfectly. Actually, in fact, if you like little Tesla coil stuff, this will be a good video for you to watch. We have this little copper wire here and we have these two brass nuts. What we're going to be doing is wrapping the copper wire around a cylinder and then folding it over like a donut. So it's going to end up being a little tiny top load for small Tesla coils, which should be fairly interesting for you guys to watch. We're going to be showing you how to wrap your own custom tiny Tesla coil top load using copper wire and a brass nut. And here with me is Jeremiah from Join the Technicians. So let's see what we're doing. So we have some 16 gauge wire here. This could be 14 gauge, 16 gauge. Both of those work very well for this purpose. And we have a 5 8 inch uh, diameter copper or aluminum tube. It could be wood, it could be any type of tube that you want something that's fairly rigid so that uh, the copper pressure doesn't deform it. So just starting out with this wire, I'm going to bend it over at a nice sharp 90 and then once again I'm going to create a nice sharp 90. This will give me something to grab onto while we wind this. This top load is 21 turns and another that we wound earlier with a much thicker gauge wire, this is uh, 12 gauge wire here. This is 22 turns, so you can see a slight size difference, but both work very well. And obviously, the thicker wire you use, the stronger it will be. Yeah, it's a stupid, uh, stupidly simple solution for this application. It really works well. It gives you the high frequency capacitance because generally the secondaries for the Titan project are uh, fairly high frequency, ranging between about 980 megahertz up to about 1.8. Or excuse me, uh, 980 uh, kilohertz up to 1.8 megahertz. Yeah, that's pretty fast for the, uh, the smaller Tesla coils. And the smallest I've tested on there is, I think, right around 8.2 megahertz. And it's a real tiny little bugger. Yeah, the smallest one that I managed to build rang at about uh, 3.5 um, megahertz. That tiny uh, e-hooker one. It's, it's kind of funny that the handheld magnifying transmitter happens to have such a high frequency. It rings in right around 5.9 to 6.1 megahertz. Well, it's pretty quick for something at size. I'd figure it'd be up in uh, maybe the like 30s to 70s range. Yeah, there's only, That's I right, believe, um, something like 40-something uh, turns on the coil. Wow. And that explains all the effluvia. Now, what's that? Uh, the, the, the corona. Smoke? Okay. Yeah, around the... Um, I've never... What's that word again? I've never heard of it. Effluvia. It's a word Tesla mentioned. Effluvia. It basically means the St. Elmo's fire that occurs around high voltage terminals I, of devices. I like that word. It, uh, it has a smoothness to it. It does. It sounds like what it is. It's kind of a fuzzy, purplish glow that seems to uh, come out of terminals at very high potentials, either AC or DC. And uh, moving an object close to the stuff it reacts very immediately. So it's it's almost alive in a manner of speaking, but I think the word effluvia sort of demonstrates some of the ideas. No, oh, you're off camera a little bit? Yeah. All right, yeah. well, let's see. We got five, oh. 10. It's interesting conversation either 15, way, I'm sure. 
Now, is there a difference between 20. this kind of coil geometry and a solid toroid, or is this functionally the same thing? So when it comes down to E-fields, as this thing is electrified at a very high frequency, meaning it has a potential of zero volts starting out, and suddenly it comes up to a high potential of, say, 10,000 volts, roughly about what a small Tesla coil would, would bring it to, it has an electric field that surrounds it, and that pushes against the local space around it, because that electric field can only travel out at the speed of light. And this thing has a coupling coefficient of capacitance to itself and all other surrounding objects, so it will basically couple at high frequencies because of these turns in their presence. In terms of whether this is better than a solid surface, in this case, at the extremely high frequencies, the electric field surrounding these wires expands both outwardly and toroidally or axially around this in these concentric circles. So you end up with an electric field at high frequencies that basically treats this object, even though it's made with wire, uh, as a solid object, as if it were a completely smooth coated surface. Now the downside is that the capacitance drops because you don't exactly have the same surface area, right? Right. Now you do have a, a you have a correspondingly lower capacitance at lower frequencies. Up to a certain point, it it really depends on the potential. But basically, this object at a higher potential will act more like a solid object than a, a wound piece of wire, and at a lower potential it'll act more like a piece of wire. The same thing occurs with direct current. If you're having a, uh, a DC potential on this, it'll act more like a piece of wire at lower voltages than if you have a DC potential at higher voltages. So it's kind of like what you're saying, uh, at higher frequencies, that AC couples with the air and acts larger than it is, or the capacitance acts larger than it is. Right, exactly. Not just with the air alone, but through the air, it AC couples through the air, with other surrounding objects, and because the air is a dielectric effectively, it has a k-factor of what we've just called 1 as our constant here on Earth. And uh, the k-factor of 1 for air allows that uh, resistance to build up basically an electric charge on this device without leaking or receiving any electrons. And so that's where our electric field comes from. This is basically one terminal of a two-terminal capacitor, and then the second terminal is everything else in the room, including yourself. So we have our 20 four turns here. We can ditch a few. We just have to wind this into a ring. And this is the tricky bit. Sure is. So that's actually six-sided, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That seems kind of convenient. Oh, yeah. Well, we are wrapping it around in it, aren't we? Yeah. So our goal is to wrap this coil around and eventually put it on one of these pieces of brass, brass nuts. And so the goal is to try to sort of evenly bend these coils, which means You've got to exert equal pressure on the inside windings and the outside windings, which is rather tricky to do, in fact. All right, well, this is probably going to take a little bit of time, so let's get back to it after one of these things are wrapped and ready to be soldered onto the nut. Okay, so we're at the point now where we're going to solder the outside of the copper wire onto this brass nut here. And I made a little jig, which involves this aluminum gear on top of the vise, and this uh, 632 screw, of which will be supporting the nut. So, we have to keep it all in one piece as we're doing the soldering process. So, right here I have some resistance wire from a hair dryer, and I am going to join the two ends here, and we're going to use the tension from this to keep this all stable as we solder it together. Now, uh, we're planning on using a heat gun in conjunction with the soldering iron to do this. Jeremiah has a different method. What's your method, Jeremiah? <laughs> with the there are two different methods. One, I use a butane torch to center heat just the nut. I allow the heat to soak into the wire around the nut and then controlling where the heat flows, we can pull the solder in the direction we need. The second method is to use a carbon rod pulled from the center of either a AA or AAA battery. And those work very well uh, with contact resistance. They can get up to uh, several thousand degrees just by touching them to the surface and have some current flowing through. So there you can do precision point soldering with a very high temperature as long as you have the current to support it. And you can use a single uh, lithium-ion 18650 to supply that current. What do you think about this? Take a look. I think it looks fantastic. All right. Uh, everything in frame. 
Let's go ahead and take a look. Yep, we are good. Two independent turns. He's gone. Uh, do you want to try to use some of this flux? Oh, you got your own flux. Okay. I do. I did bring flux, and I'll have to apply that with some other tool, I think. Oops. This is a nice washable flux. It is pretty low melting temperature in comparison to, say, plumbing flux. And you can rinse it away very easily with just soap and water. Alcohol probably removes it really well, too. Yeah, alcohol solves this stuff very, very well. Oh, that's the Amtec flux, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah, this is the Amtec flux. It's oftentimes used in soldering CPUs that are integrated on certain circuit boards, like uh, video game consoles and the like. Oh, the uh, outer ring came off. Bring it in uh, up to a slightly higher set adjustment before we go ahead and solder that. And it's kind of nice that uh, the spring has grooves and you can kind of tuck it in. It is. I just want to make sure that this is facing the junction point between the two sides is facing towards me so I can get a good connection there. Alright, I would say we're clear to heat. Alright, sounds good. Alright, we'll see if we can begin to solder this at this point here. Am I uh, getting too close to your hand with the heat gun? Not at all. Okay. Now that's a good sign. Good respect. Yeah, feel free to wrap it around in whatever place it needs to be set. It's certainly whipping the heat away. Almost as if the soldering iron is shutting off. It's not even melting the solder right now. Oh. oh, overheat condition. Is it? Okay. We'll shut that off and let it reset. Still in an overheat condition? Huh. That might be. I mean, the heat gun does get pretty hot. Well, that's not good. What? It's indicating overheat. And not shutting off. Also, it's not melting the solder. Oh, the plug looks a little dirty. Let me get the sandpaper still, yeah? I've had the same sort of issue. Well, it's not exactly uh, the latest and greatest technology, is it? It's still pretty damn good for what it is. Oh, yeah. Is that tip working? Nope. It's not delivering power to the tip. Uh, what uh, range is that potentiometer? Like 50k down? No, no, it's uh, it's 284 ohms to like 345 ohms. Yeah, that looks right. That should be right, yeah? Yeah, right around 290, uh, 295. Oh, really? You may not have fun right now. That is true. Where is that side of it? Oh, yeah, is there a tip in it? You would certainly know if it was working. There he goes. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Okay. Alright. Well, I don't know what that was about. Do you want to touch up these uh these tips real quick? Maybe it was a bad connection here. Could have been. I'll deal with it later. Is the copper uh, cool down? Very much so. Wonderful. Let me get in there. 
I guess not both at the same time, mm -hmm. hey? Alright, I can get in there. Let's take that away. Have to get the spring back on there in just a moment, but for now, start to get this heat in here. And it's already cooling beyond the point the soldering iron can actually operate it. Alright, let me get in there again. I don't know if this is the uh, the right solution. Let me just try to get some solder on both these pieces. Oh, let's get the solder then. I mean, yeah, that seems to be working. Yeah, let's turn it up a little. Oh, this is up. Oh, uh, this is up as we can go on the soldering iron. That's as high as it goes. Yeah. And she won't go any higher than that. Not that I know. Unless that connection is a Wonka or something. So. Yeah, once this gets in here, then you should be able to heat gun it and really allow it to flow. Oh. The addition of a small amount of flux. Getting that bridge connection right now. The copper has most certainly oxidized. Yep, soldering iron is not capable. Oh, it's gone into fail mode again. I've never had this problem before. Well, I have, but. Maybe we just need to run it at a lower temperature while we're doing this. Or oh, it's strange. It is strange. I haven't really had this problem with mine. Oh, where's the alcohol? I'm going to clean off that contact. Maybe there's some oxide or something in there. Alcohol. Oh, there it is, right there. I'm going to have the alcohol real quick. Uh, do you want to use the heat gun then to try and get it warmer while you do that part, or do you want to keep that flux on I think the heat gun can actually do the job at this point. Uh, I'm just trying to get the flux in the correct position so that we get some solder flow there. That is working quite well. Awesome. Wow, look at that. Soldering temperature is going to heat it right in. Yeah, let's uh, get a view on how that looks over here. Can you zoom in on that area? And it left it with a really interesting color, which oh, I is. think is fantastic. Oh, nice color. And I'll stick with this, just make sure it's all pressed down. Yeah, these will uh, be interesting to test on a Tiny Titan for sure. Heck yeah, I really like the color. Oh, you guys will love what the Tiny Titan is. That is pretty darn cool, I'm going to be honest. I think that's fantastic. I love the color. Yeah, that looks beautiful. It does. Your soldering iron has totally crapped out on you again. Yeah. But I need the soldering iron to port your mouth. And I am certainly hoping that that is nice and even. Not perfectly, but... Certainly close enough, and it can be straightened by hand. Maybe it's the wire. Oh, maybe it is the wire. It could be in the head, the probe piece. Oh, uh, it you... unscrews at the bottom. Ah. Bench connector. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna angle it. How am I fighting myself, right? Indeed. Alright. Functional. Functional. I'm gonna go ahead and clean that out maybe a little later too.
Cool. So uh, there it is. I'm just going to go ahead and straighten up these wires and correct their rotation. We'll have a very nice little top load for the Titan. Well, there's the Titan with the new top load, and we have a couple of LEDs on top of it to help enhance and demonstrate what's going on. So we'll flip the lights off, and you can see everything that's happening. The starting iron is red again. So obviously we haven't fixed the problem with whatever was up with it. Sure looks like not. Do you think it uh, would have been interference from the Tesla coil? Yeah, I really wouldn't expect it would be interference from this coil. Mm, well. I, uh, a Tesla coil would have a heck of a time getting a signal into that cable, wouldn't it? Yeah, but you were messing around with the, uh, the Tiny Titan before we uh, started doing the video. Well, I don't believe it was on when the system shut off, so I wonder what's up with it now. Well, Tiny Titan's not bringing it back, that's for sure. Yeah, it doesn't seem to really care about this thing. Well, what if I told you that if it is interference from a Tesla coil? And then I would ask you to show me how. Well, you're in luck. So, here's what I found out. I made this little uh, lyric for your Tesla coil, and uh, for whatever reason, the frequency that it makes actually ends up jamming the feedback of my soldering iron. So, I got a little switch here that I've been turning on and off under the desk. <laughs> and that's why we've been having problems. He totally got me. <laughs> Unreal. That's a decent little slayer too. Yeah. Yeah, flip it on for a second. That's a uh, fairly effective range. I like how it mimicked the uh, the wires. The wire was going over it um, and acting like a wire issue. This must have been eating up the field. Isn't that great? <laughs> that is fantastic. Oh, can't see a darn thing with the lights on. I'll turn the lights off. That's not bad for it's a pretty nifty little room. gadget, really. It really is. It has a lot of fun. I can't believe I haven't built a simple device like this. I've got to overcomplicate everything, it seems. Yeah, but this one isn't shooting out three inch sparks like yours. So, so it isn't. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> Very awesome. Yeah. Man, I can't believe that soldering iron. Oh, I know. That really got me. Well, thank you for stopping over, Jeremiah. I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. And as for everybody else, stay tuned for more. Indeed.